We are the ship, fifth inning. The greatest baseball players in the world. Negro League All-Stars. The greatest untapped reservoir of raw material in the history of our game is the black race. Branch Rickey, owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers. If you ask most people what they know about the Negro Leagues, they probably won't be able to tell you much. They might name a few players like Satchel Paige, Josh Gibson, or maybe Cool Papa Bell, but that's usually about it. These guys were excellent players for sure, but the Negro Leagues were much more than just a few ball players. Satchel, Josh, and Cool Papa were great athletes because they played against other great athletes. Satchel Paige was one of the, our finest pitchers, but we had other guys who threw just as hard and even harder. Josh Gibson was a powerful hitter, but he had other fellas who could hit just as hard. The Negro Leagues were full of guys who were stars in their own right. Many of our guys could have rewritten the records books if they had been given the chance to play in the majors. We had a fellow named George Mule Suttles who played for the Newark Eagles. He was a bigum. We used to say he hit the ball like a mule kicks. Fans would yell, kick, mule, kick. And he'd get take a great big swing like Babe Ruth. He'd even thrill you when he struck out. Darn near screwed himself into the ground when he missed. But when he connected, he'd send it high and far. He killed curveballs. They would have to stop the game to measure how far they went. One of our best hitters was Norman Turkey Stearns. He was a quite but quiet but peculiar fellow who used to talk to his bats. Turkey said his nickname came from the pot belly he had as a child that made him look kind of like a little turkey. He had an odd batting stance and would choke up on the bat, but he sure could bust him. He had more home runs than anyone in the league. And here's a painting of Josh Gibson. We had another fellow, Judd Wilson. Mean fellow, real big upper body and little old legs. His knuckles were just about in the dirt. He scared the daylights out of the pitchers. He crowded the plate and wouldn't back off. Just let the ball hit him so he would get on base. He could hit that long ball, too. But he had a bad temper. Always got into fights. He used to bully everybody, even the umpires. If they made a call he didn't agree with, he would go after them. Chase those poor fellows all around the field. Oscar Charleston was one of the greatest ball players, black or white, in the history of the game. Certainly one of the best in his days. Many of the old-time white ball players who played against him would agree. He was like Hall of Fame Ty Cobb. He played hard and would do anything to win. He could run right over you if you were blocking the base. Cut you with his spikes. And that fellow was strong. Once he tore the steering wheel off of a car. He could grab a baseball and loosen up the leather with his bare hands. He played center field and stood right behind second base. If the ball was hit over his head, he'd run back and get it. He just outrun the ball and could hit to all fields. Fans would chant, Charlie, 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 when he came to bat. Didn't matter where it was pitched, he'd get wood on it. No pitch was a bad pitch to him. Buck Leonard was the same way. Couldn't get a ball past him. Some called him the Black um, Gagreg. He was one of our finest all-around players. Real clean fellow. Didn't smoke or curse. He had a real nice swing. You could always count on him getting on base. He killed fastballs. And he was an excellent first baseman. Dixie and Newt Allen were two of our best second basemen. And Pop Lloyd was one of the most superb all-time shortstops in the world. They nicknamed him the Black Wagner. In Cuba, they called him El Cuchara, or the, sh the shovel, because he had big hands. 
He would scoop up grounders, dirt, and everything, and zing them to first base. Willie Wells was an excellent shortstop, too. Both of those guys are in the Hall of Fame. Ray Dan Dandred was one of our top third basemen. He was a real flashy, quite a showman. He would scoop up the ball and throw it all in one motion. They called him Squatty because he was so bow-legged. You could drive a train through his legs, but not a baseball. Judy Johnson was an outstanding third baseman, too. He would charge the ball. He wasn't as flashy as Dandridge, but he always got the job done and was a very smart fellow. In the outfield, we had Ted Page, Jimmy Grutchfield, Turkey Stearns, and, of course, Cool Papa Bell, who was the fastest man in all of baseball. He was like lightning. Cool Papa could circle the bases in 12 to 13 seconds. One minute, he was standing still on first base, and next thing you know, he was slowing up on third. More than once, he scored from first base on a bunt. He was so fast, Jesse Owens, the Olympic sprinter, wouldn't race him without his track shoes. And he was also in shape. Never had to worry about him getting tired. Here is a painting of William Julius or Judy Johnson. He could hit and had a good arm. All right, and then here's a painting of the mighty Josh Gibson as he watches Satchel Paige pitch to Buck Leonard, Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C., circa 1943. Many folks don't know how he used to, he used to be a pitcher, an old knuckleballer. He was a real quiet fellow, too. He wouldn't argue at all. That's why they called him Cool Papa, because he was so easy going. Behind the plate, we had highly skilled catchers like Pepper, Bassett, Josh Gibson, Quinny Troop, Troupe, and Roy Campanella. But Rayleigh Biz Mackey was probably the greatest defensive catcher in Negro League history. Roy Campanella, the catcher who played with Jackie Robinson on the Brooklyn Dodgers, learned everything he knew about catching from Mackey. When you see Campy's moves behind the plate, you were seeing Mackey's. He was a great technician. Handled pitchers with ease and could throw to second base from a crouch. Couldn't fool around with him. Nobody would try to steal on Biz. He'd throw you out. He didn't drop many balls either, especially fly balls. He didn't even take off his mask to catch them. Solid hitter, too. <clears throat> on the mound, we had fireballers like Smoky, Smoky Joe Williams, Willie Foster, Rube's younger brother, Andy Cooper, Hilton Smith, Vertel Mathis, Cannonball, Dick Redding, Bullet Rogan, Leon Day, and many others. But the most famous of all pitchers was Leroy Satchel Page. He got his nickname Satchel when he was a boy. He used to work at the train depot carrying folks bags and satchels. Satchel was a masterful pitcher and by far the greatest showman. People came out by the thousands to see him pitch. If a team needed some some cash, Wilkinson would send him out there to pitch a few innings for them. Satchel made a lot of money doing that. He pitched for more than 250 teams. That fellow was something else. We'd be waiting around for Satchel to show up for a game, and he was nowhere to be found. Then he'd arrive just a few minutes before game time with a police escort, sirens blazing and all. He always kept us laughing. We would walk real slow to the mound and let his long arms dangle. Satchel didn't believe in running. A few times he called in the outfield and struck out the side without giving up a single hit. He was tall and skinny. If he turned sideways, he disappeared. His arms were just as skinny around his biceps as his wrists. We used to say they were like rubber hoses or long black snakes. Nowadays, pitchers pitch 
maybe once or twice a week and rest a few days in between. Not Satchel. He pitched every day. He lived on that mound. He said he kept his arm young by taking boiling hot showers. He would tie a big Turkish towel around his arm and let the hot water run off it. Nowadays, pitchers use ice for their arms, but back then they used heat. He also rubbed his arm with his this real hot snake oil that some African or some American Indian fellow gave him. He wouldn't give up that secret formula for anything. When Satchel pitched, he raised his big foot up high, let it come down, and then whipped the ball by you. Satchel was nothing but fastball. Even his slow stuff was fast. We knew what was coming, but we still couldn't hit it. The ball would be moving so fast it looked like a little white pill by the time it got to the plate. And it would jump just a little bit before it got to you. Just enough to make you miss it. Satchel wasn't legendary only for his speed, but also for his control. So here is a painting of Rayleigh Biz Mackey. He was the one who trained um, Roy Campanella. He could put the ball wherever he wanted to. So here is a painting of Leroy Satchel Page, the Yankee um, Stadium in Bronx, New York, circa 1942. They said he was super tall and skinny. Most pitchers warmed up by throwing over home plate or a glove, but Satchel used a candy wrapper or a bottle cap. A catcher only had to hold up his glove, and Satchel would hit it. Satchel liked to drive fast, too. Drove like a demon. He'd get stopped for speeding in some small towns on his way to a game. Once he got stopped and the judge fined him $25, Satchel took out a wad of cash and started peeling off $10 bills. Told the judge, here's 50. I'm coming back tomorrow. I'm coming back through tomorrow. Yeah, that Satchel was something else. One of Satchel's rivals at the plate was Josh Gibson. Josh was hitting that ball out of ballparks everywhere. He hit more home runs than anybody except Turkey Stearns. Some say Josh hit the ball out of Yankee Stadium. Not even Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth did that. He had the most beautiful natural swing. His body was built for hitting. Slender waist, big muscular back. He would roll his sleeves up so that the pitcher could see his powerful arms. He stood flat-footed and would just mash the ball. The ball would shoot straight towards the outfield and still be on its way up as it cleared the fence. It would land about 400 or 500 feet away. If an infielder had tried to catch it before it took off, the ball would have probably taken him with it. Josh hit everything. Fastballs, curveballs. Couldn't fool him. Pitchers would just have to pitch and pray. He was so good. People started calling him Mr. Black Baseball. Some even called him the Black Babe Ruth. But others say that the babe should have been called the white Josh Gibson. Josh was a real jolly fellow. He, We used to say that he was like a big kid and great behind the plate too. When he started out, he wasn't as good of a catcher as he was a hitter. But he wanted to become a complete player, so he really worked hard on developing his arm and, most of all, his accuracy. He became one of the better defensive players. He could pick you off at second from a crouch. That man was awesome. But you know something? He, We had many Josh Gibsons in the Negro Leagues. We had many Satchel Pages. But you never heard about them. That's a shame the world didn't get to see them play. The Negro Leagues were home to some of the greatest baseball players that ever lived. Guys like Stuart Slim Jones, John Beckwith, Dick Lundy, and Oliver Marcel, Newt Allen, Dobby Moore, Jimmy Crutchfield, Pepper Bassett, Dan and Sam Bankhead, Buck O'Neill, Bingo DeMoss, Joe Black, Roy Partlow, Ted Page, Alex and Ted Double Duty Radcliffe, Chet Brewer, Quincy Truppe, Andy Pullman Porter, Piper Davis, Walter McCoy, Mule Miles, Wild Billy Wright, there were just so, so many. Can't even name them all. 
Unfortunately, most of them will never receive the recognition that they deserve. We can only hope the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown will someday open the doors to more of these fellows. And here's a painting of Norman Turkey Stearns.